Turn your Bibles to John chapter 12. Like I said, we're normally going through the book of Exodus as a church. We're taking a break. We're going to focus on John 12, verses 20 through 22, and 1 Peter 3, 15. While you're turning there, I'm going to read it. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20, it says this. Now, there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. At this point in Jesus' ministry, because please keep in mind, it is the world's hardest thing to just pick a random passage and just, like, teach. Context is very important, and especially in light of what I'm trying to convey. The, the, the layout of what, what's happening in John's gospel is that in the 11th chapter, Jesus did something really important that spread quickly. He met Mary and Martha, and Mary and Martha came weeping to Jesus because Jesus, as Martha put it in John chapter 11, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Remember this story? Jesus wept. He goes to the tomb. He asks to remove the rock. And then he says, Lazarus, come forth. And here's Lazarus hobbling out. He's alive and well. And that news spread quickly. I mean, people are watching. Wait, he died days ago. And this Jesus of Nazareth raised him from the dead. I mean, there's no way that happened. No, there, there's Lazarus. He's eating falafels across the street. There he is, alive and well. News was spreading quickly about Jesus doing this. And then you fast forward to John chapter 12, and then Jesus did this triumphal entry, entering into Jerusalem on a donkey. We know this because we celebrate this during Palm Sunday. And we know this because in that passage of scripture, the people are acknowledging him as king. And in John chapter 12, verse 13, they started shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus receives this public worship. And no doubt, it drew a lot of attention to him. It drew a lot of attention to what was happening with raising Lazarus from the dead. And it drew a lot of attention when he was acknowledged as king. And by the way, it made me think about it just in a whole, as a whole. People's motives for wanting to learn about Jesus. In fact, this is a passage of scripture I read with my girls yesterday during our Bible time. And I asked my girls, I said, why do you think people want to see Jesus? And they all answered absolutely correct. They were like, well, because, you know, God is deserving of, of our worship and we should seek after him. And, you know, some, some of them said, because God, you know, knows our needs. And then Jaden, my oldest, said, well, because he's king and he knows everything. And all of those are absolutely true. And it's even invited by Jesus. Jesus will say in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 30, come to me. He sends the invite to come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me because I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But we don't treat God that way sometimes. A lot of times with Jesus, we're like, I just don't want to be a bothersome to Jesus. I mean, what I have to say, it's not really that important. But for Jesus, he's like, come on. Come to me. I'm inviting you to come to me, to cast your cares upon me. I think it is true that you guys are here maybe in celebration to watch your loved ones get baptized. And, you, you know, and by the way, the title of this message is just give them Jesus. And that's the beauty about baptisms is you're hearing people who were lost now found and they're giving you Jesus because they have Jesus in their life now and they want others to know about it. So for us, we want to see Jesus, just like we're seeing in John 12 with these Greeks, that we don't know who they are. We know that they're there to practice, and maybe they've embraced Judaism to some extent, but they see Philip, and they know that's the guy that knows Jesus. And then it made me think, why do you think some other people come to see Jesus? In my years of experience, a lot of people want to come to see Jesus because of a crisis. Because there's a death in the family. Because you have a couple who are getting a divorce. Because of a job loss or whatever it is. And then you go through this, this crisis of faith. Why would Jesus do this? Why would he allow this to happen to me? And they almost come like, I, need, I have questions for Jesus. 
And then we face this issue called this deconstructing of the faith where you have people looking at why they believe in what they believe, which, by the way, is not a bad thing. Biblically speaking, Paul says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. I think there's something good about this notion of understanding, like, why do I believe in what I believe? And for the, the Greeks who see Philip, they're like, I know he knows Jesus. And they come to him and they say, we desire to see Jesus. And then Philip is like, okay, let me talk to Andrew. And then Andrew's like, oh, okay, let me talk to Jesus. And again, I wish we could talk more in full about the chapter. But then it made me start to think about this as a whole. Maybe someone's come to you saying, I know you know Jesus. You're a Christian, right? Like, you follow Christ, right? And they start asking you questions, and maybe and either you have the answers or you don't have the answers. And it made me think about when I first gave my life to the Lord. It was the summer of 2000. I was 15 years old, and I knew I loved Jesus, and I knew I wanted to serve him, and I was intentionally getting rid of all the things that were a part of my old lifestyle. And I remember there was this one particular guy who was just a menace, meaning he treated me poorly. He was intentionally violent towards me. Like, he would get his pencil and, like, stab me on the side, laugh, and, like, run off. He would go around the school asking for kids to sell him their souls. He would say, I'll give you five bucks if you write that I can have your soul. And then he would burn it in front of them. Like, sociopath, right? I had a hard time with him. And I remember... I remember one particular evening the Lord was convicting me and saying, you need to pray. I won't say his name, John Stark. Anyways, um, <laughs> and I thought, you want me to pray for, why, why do you want me to pray for Satan's son? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, what's the hope in that? And, the, and I remember the Lord was like, just as you were lost, he's lost too. And you need to pray for him. And that was the extent. I thought, okay, I'm going to pray for him. The next day, I kid you not, the next day, we're in the PE locker room. I'm getting ready, and he comes up to me, and he's like, I have a question. And I'm on guard because he's a sociopath, right? And I'm just like, what? And he said, I know this is hard to believe, but I know that you know Jesus, and I have some questions. And I was just shocked because I'm waiting for, the, like, for him to push a button and like snakes fall on me or something. But it didn't happen. And, I'm sit- and the questions he had were so good. And a lot of them I didn't have the answers to. And it was as simple as like, you know, I wish I knew, but can we get back to this? And we developed this dialogue, which made me think as a whole. How do we give people Jesus? And I think the answer is, if we want to give people Jesus, we have to know the word. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 15. So first lesson, if we want to give people Jesus, we have to, give, we, we have to know the word individually. 1 Peter 3, 15. Sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. The heart for us as a church, guys, is that you love God's word. You fall in love with his word, that you don't just hear it on Sundays, but you you get this excitement when you read the word. And you start eating it up, and you begin to answer the question, why do I believe in Jesus? So if someone were to come up to you, why do you believe in Jesus? How are you able to give a defense for the hope that is in you? And so I look at that as a whole, and then it made me start to think, we so badly want faith, and we pray for faith, which isn't wrong, but the last time I checked the word, it says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. There is an element of faith where you ask the Lord to increase it, but really it comes your responsibility to know the word of God. That you individually make an effort to say, if I want to give people Jesus, then I need to know more about Jesus, and it's going to be found in the Word. And that's very generic, but let me just give you just some helpful tips. Maybe you're going through the Gospel of Mark at home, and you're reading some passages, and you're like, I don't get this. I'm going to give you some free resources. You ready? EnduringTheWord.com, or type in Google David Gusick. And he has an online commentary of every book in the entire Bible, all 66 books. He has it all written out. So if you have a question, you're like, I don't understand this passage, and he explains it. 
And maybe some of you have a theological question and you're trying to understand what this means. Well, then go to gotquestions.com and then type it in and it gives you a layout to understand how biblically to think about this. And the, the greater point that I'm trying to make is that each of you, I know you want to know more about the Lord. Well, then faith is going to come by you reading the word of God. If you want to give people to Jesus, you got to know the word. And then once you start knowing the word, isn't it true though? You read this passage and you're like, I, want, I got to show someone else. Maybe you post it on Facebook or maybe you're talking to someone, which leads to our next point. If you want to give people Jesus, you need to know it individually. Second point, then you need to have community. All right, Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It's a safe place. You ready? Who in here genuinely wants community in their life? And, I, and you know what? Even if you're not raising your hand, you're like, I'm an introvert. And that might be true. But you know what? I know each of you desire so much to have someone in your life that you can talk to that you can walk through this process and ask questions that are really hard. And you know what? I know we've been saying this, but I'm going to just promote it because it's Vision Sunday. It's Baptism Sunday. If you really want to see God do a work in your life, it can't be just talk anymore. One of the heartbeats of our church is going to be community groups, our CSD groups. And, and this isn't something that's just going to be... My wife and I have been talking about this. We took, we've taken a two-year... We've had community but we've taken a two-year break prepping for taking over this church. And this is the third year that's coming on for me leading the church. And I'm here to tell you, I, I, I long for community in the context of a CSD group. I long for it. I need that. And I know for you guys, I can't expect you to join a group if the, the leadership isn't doing it. And I've given the challenges to our staff on some things they're going to work on too. But here it is. Let's not talk about being a part of community anymore. Let's join a group now. And maybe it's something as simple as, as coming to someone and inviting them over for dinner. Because here's what I've come to realize when it comes to community. In a time of crisis, your community you surround yourself with are going to be the ones supporting your arms up. They're the, the ones who are going to be there when it's hard. When you get that call that mom died, that someone died, that someone is sick in the family. I'm at the hospital. They're going to call you. And as much as we want to, as a leadership, know everyone's problem, because I do, the, the more effective work as a church as a whole is when you are exercising your gift that better helps the church. I know what my gifts are, and I know what I can and can't do, but the Lord's been showing me this important value that if you want to give people Jesus, you've got to have community. You really do. And as you begin to see the benefit of it, as some of you like look at it as a whole, you're like, I really don't like that. There's a lot of things in Christianity I don't like, not pertaining to Christianity, but how I'm challenged. I don't like to be challenged in certain ways, but I need it. It's necessary. And now that you're giving people Jesus because you're learning his word individually, and you're, you're giving people Jesus because now you have community, this is the third and final point. If you want to give people Jesus, you have to have intentionality. What do I mean by that? Listen to this. John 3, 13, 34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. You know, we have this concept where we like talking about Christ's love, which is absolutely true. But this is where the intentionality comes in. If we want to let our light so shine before men, because we know that verse, let your light so shine, but let your light so shine so that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven as a result. You know what that tells me? That tells me you have to intentionally serve one another, that that is a visible characteristic that people see Christ through you. Because you could love, let your light so shine. I'm letting my light so shine by playing Caleb in my car while driving. That's not, you're, just, you're worshiping the Lord. But it's getting your hands dirty and being involved in people's lives when it's messy. It's saying, I'm going to serve you. And this is the beauty of, if you're joining a community group that you can join together and say, hey, such and such in, the fam in, our, in our family at the church is suffering. Or such and such lost someone. And you know what? I, I, maybe we should go. Over, it's been like three months and I'm seeing their yard is just obliterated. But hey, maybe our group can serve them. Or maybe there's someone sick and you're like, hey, let's have our group make meals for this person. Hey, let's call them and ask, how can I help you? 
How can I serve you? And they might be, you know, like, no, thank you, I'm good, I'm good. But at least you're persistent to show, I want to serve you. And so if there is any way, let me know. And a way that also we can let our light so shine, you ready for this, is discipleship. Grant Skeleton wrote a book called Passion Generation. And he posed an issue that is thick and evident now. And you want to know what this issue is? Because it's a problem with me too. We look at people who are younger than us and we get mad at them. (laughs) Can you believe it? Can you believe these people? When I was young, and then you fill in the blank. (laughs) And you know what? The problem is we do this and we complain. And the the question, what Grant Skelton and Passion Generation poses is instead of complaining about people younger than you who aren't doing anything, how many of you are discipling them? And then it made me think, man, I'm really good at complaining, but I'm not intentional about finding people to disciple. And so I'm going to pose this thing with you. If you want to be intentional to give people Jesus, think of what, right now, th- let's not make this a night like a hopeful thing. Hopefully I'll remember what John said later. Right now, think about that person that you can invite into your life, as simple as breaking bread together. Want to come over and have din- dinner with my family? You're like, no, I can't do that, John, because then they're going to see how my kids really are. Let them see it. Let them see the good and the bad and the ugly of your life. Let them see that you are a human being who desires to know more about Jesus and you want to pour into them. People want you to be real. They don't want you to pretend that you have a life all figured out. You know what they want? They want to see that you can relate with them. And that's found through intentional invitations to ask them to be a part of your life. But it only can happen. And it really only can happen if you actually go, which is a biblical concept. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Not schedule an appointment to see when they're available. No, go, therefore, and make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. How do you accomplish this? When you're reading God's word together. You want to give them Jesus? Spend time together. And really, and I'm going really fast because we're going to invite the, the, the team to come up here in a moment. But really the heart of what I hope to see at CSD is a threefold measure. Give, them, give everyone we come into contact Jesus. Give it individually so that we know the word. We have, if we want to give people Jesus, we need to give a defense for the hope that's in us. So we've got to know God's word. If we want to give people Jesus, we need to do it in community. Because really, we want to bear one another's burdens. Life's too hard to do this by ourselves, guys. When my daughter was in the hospital, I just was so overwhelmed and just yet so at peace because of the amount of people praying for her. And then it made me think about you guys when that happened to us. It made me think, I am so, I'm so blessed, Lord, that there were hundreds of people around the world praying for her. And then it made me think about you guys that I know you want that too. But the only way you can get that is if you're a part of a community and you're sharing with each other the problems in your life. And third and finally, as much as we want to talk about this as a concept, let's make it a reality and be intentional about serving one another. That we're intentional to invite people into our house and really fulfill the Great Commission to go and make disciples. I don't want to be a Christian country club anymore. And I know you guys don't. I want to get my hands dirty. I want to be a part of your life. And as much as I think I can be a part of every person's life here, I can't. But that's where you guys come in. You can support one another. And that's what makes what we're doing right now all the more appropriate. It's baptism day. We get to hear how people came to know the Lord. In fact, I'm going to invite the worship team to come up right now, and I want to pose this idea to you. As we're, we're going to hear, you're, those who are getting baptized, you're about to come up after I pray. You're going to give your testimony. For some of you, we're going to put you in the water, and a lot of you might wonder, like, why do we do this? I'm going to read to you what Paul said in Romans. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 6. Paul said, or do you not know that as many of you Many of us, as we're baptized into Christ, were baptized unto his death. 
Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism in, unto death, into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And that's really what it comes down to. Anyone who's in Christ, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away. And Jesus said, if you believe in me, though you die, you live. And the, the reason why we can hold on to that, because just as Christ was buried in the ground, he rose again. And so for you, we have this symbolic, beautiful thing that one day each of us are going to die. Every single person in this room, we're going to die one day. But the promise and the hope of the gospel is we're going to rise again. And for, for, so that's what we're going to do. For some of you, I'm going to take you under. I'm going to put you down. Some of you are going to be down a little longer than normal. Shh, you need to be down a little on baptized. Um, but really, guys, as you hear them start talking and give their testimony, and as the worship is taking place, pray for them. And celebrate. let's celebrate with those who are now giving, not only giving their life to Jesus, but making a public declaration that their life belongs to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Have a good day. I know a lot of you, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kendall. Um, I've been a part of this Calvary community for, oh gosh, probably 20 years now. Um, and we've been through a lot. Um, so for those of you who have been through that with me, just thank you. Thank you for being here and rejoicing with me today. I wrote it, so I'm going to read it. I met Jesus as a little girl. From that young age forward, I knew who I belonged to. My life would be spent learning about my God and growing in the knowledge of his goodness, sovereignty, and love. My youth spent in pursuit of serving Jesus and others would be intertwined with seasons of testing boundaries, rebelling, and experiencing God's grace time after time. As the seasons changed and the chapters rode on through marriage, parenting, professional success, booming community, service in the church, friendship of plenty, the innermost parts of my spirit began to feel empty. It would be years of highs and lows, deep, deep lows, before I would understand what was missing. There was a journey to go on. And God was going to show me a few things I hadn't quite asked for, but had spent a lifetime preparing for. It was time to step into big girl faith and step down off my throne, allowing God to fully and rightly sit there. I needed to remove my adornments of success, servanthood, friendship, and pretense. While I battled with God over whose will would be accomplished, I never could have dreamed that he would use my own anger, confusion, belligerence, and ugliness to bring me the most magnificent and beautiful breaking point, and then replace it all with mercy, freedom, and total forgiveness. At the very end of myself, having run, hidden, and all but cursed the name of my Lord, I finally surrendered my whole heart, my every burden, invited him to search every corner of the heart he created to love him, and I chose to trust him. What was missing was intimacy. Over the next several weeks and months, miracles began to happen before my eyes, almost to my disbelief, but it was so very real and so deeply personal a marriage held together only by signatures on a document would become an active covenant alive for the first time. Chains had been broken and God took a devastated barren marriage when I was ready to abandon. And as he began to heal every broken part, I realized how much he must love me and how close he desires to be to me. He wants me as I am. No barriers, no pride of my own, just wholeness in Jesus. Baptism today holds a new significance for me than it did nearly 30 years ago. As a little girl, 
but I make this decision today just as bold and rooted as she was, knowing I'm his and he's mine. But now I know a little bit more about what it means to take up my cross and to really follow him. Hi, uh, my name is Matt. Um, I know a lot of you here, you know me. Um, but I grew up attending church and Sunday school. Um, but God was never really a part of my daily life. I was a believer, but never really understood truly what that meant. Um, prayer was pretty much non-existent in my life um, over the years, and I did not have a relationship with God. In 2011, I married my wife, Kendall, and started attending Calvary South Denver with her. It had been a long time before that since I had attended church, unless it was Christmas or Easter with my family or special occasions. Over the years, I came to the church, volunteered to serve, met some great people. But outside of the church, God was still not really a big part of my life. I did not have a relationship with God still. I was selfish and prideful in my life. I wanted to be in control of every aspect of my life. I was incapable of placing my trust in God to be in control. As time went on, there were countless struggles. Heartache and depression were a common occurrence. What faith I had was constantly wavering. My marriage was falling apart and all seemed lost. I was at the end of my rope and ready to give up. Redemption and restoration seemed impossible. I tried so hard to be in control, and now everything was spiraling and out of control. It was in these times, these darkest times, that I relinquished my desire to be in control. I started praying, seeking the guidance of people that are wiser than I am. And answered prayer after answered prayer, and miracle after miracle, God started showing me how great he is and how much he loves me. Before I felt like it was the end, but really this is just my beginning, my beginning of a new life with our Lord Jesus at the center of it. I stand here today choosing to be baptized, redeemed with a full heart, strong in my faith, and now knowing what it means to be a believer. Hello, I'm Chance Hendricks, and uh, I've kind of, I've, I've been a believer, but I've been like a lukewarm Christian most of my life. Um, didn't really attend church growing up, um, but this past year and a half has been kind of rough, losing family members and um, just God's kind of called me out a lot on a lot of things I've been dealing with, been depressed at times, and luckily I've been attending this church for a, a year, and uh, He's just revealed to me that I need Him, and I want Him more than I've ever wanted anything in my life. And uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm kind of at a loss of words. I, I just, <sighs> I've been afraid, and I don't want to be afraid anymore. And I, I want a new life, and I want a life in Jesus Christ. Jason, I'm new to this church. I haven't been to church in like 10 years. My friend here, Judah, got me back into it. <laughs> I got through my friends here that for this special occasion that I want to say that it's been great coming back to Christ, coming back to all of this. My life before him, it was crazy. I didn't know him at all. I didn't think I would know him like I did now. It was, for the things I did in my past, I want to put that all behind me, all behind me with all the love of Christ, with all the love of my friends, my family. For the things that Judah, all my friends have done, welcomed me into their house, fed me. I made so many new friends so many people here that have the same beliefs as me. 
Christ is the only way. I believe that. <laughs> For he is mine and I am his. For this baptism, I am glad that all my friends, all these people have came. Hi, my name is Asher and I'm 11 years old. <sighs> Jesus always meant something to me. He died upon the cross so I could live. He took my punishment so I could live. He is my fortress, he is my rock. Before I was a Christian, I was lying and stealing. <sighs> the, the Bible says in that in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. <sighs> when I heard that verse, I wanted that. I gave my life to him. Now I announce that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I know that I'm a child of God because of John 1.12. Yet to those who received him, to those who believed his name, gave the right to come, children of God. I am thankful to know Ro Romans 8.38 and 39. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation, we will separate from all of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anne. I was baptized and raised a Catholic. As a child, I was taught that we did not read the Bible as the priest would, re would interpret it and tell us everything we need to know. Liking to please, I went along with this even though I had fears, questions, and concerns. Much later in my life, there was a devastating incident that sent me reeling, and when I went to my parish to ask for help, I received none. So I went to Mass to ask God for help. The homily that the priest was giving was so dark, demoralizing, and without any hope that I left and never returned. My husband always read the Bible, and it gave him hope and comfort. When I read, it was hard to understand, and so I gave up and kept depending on myself. I went along till things got so hard for me that one morning on my way to work, I started crying and called out to God, telling him that I could not do this anymore. That evening, I went home and told my husband about it. I said to God that I believed in him and was giving my life over to him, that I was a sinner and asked for his forgiveness. After that, when I read the Bible, it made sense, so I wanted to read more. When my father passed, a couple of my siblings started giving me a hard time calling me a traitor, anathema, and a heretic. I started studying more in the Bible verses, teachings in the Catholic Church so that I could better witness to them about God's word. After a while, I got this pressing feeling that it was really important for me to be baptized publicly, professing my belief in Jesus Christ, and to profess a continuing commitment as a child of God. Hello, my name is Dan. I'm a follower of Christ Jesus. I'm 47 years old and I've spent my life trying to find peace, love, and happiness. I've done many, many things which I'm truly sorry and ashamed of. Trying to find that peace, love, and happiness, nothing worked. I was trying to scratch an itch, never ending itch, digging deeper, deeper, peering harder. I could feel my soul bleeding, trying to scratch that itch, I could not stand the horrible, disgusting person I had become. I finally came to realize unless something drastic was done, I don't know how to continue. The only way to correct course was for a full hard turn to the right, the righteousness of God. Correcting the course was not easy. 
As soon as I walked into CSD, Pastor Jimmy Waddles welcomed me with his big smile and showed me around. As I sat through service, I knew this was right. I knew God had been leading me here, that he did not leave me, but I had left him. Now, three years later, I found that peace, love, and happiness through Jesus Christ and my new family in this church. I am so very happy and grateful for today. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jackie, and I'm very well seasoned. <laughs> I have a dream that was said by Martha Luther King back in 1963. And today, I have a dream to serve Jesus Christ and God the Father starting in 2022. I thank my daughter, Patricia, for bringing me to Colorado last May when my life changed. My son, Dan, for bringing me to CSD. And Steve, my first friend at CSD, believing in me. Thank you, guys. Lord Jesus, you are always with me, and I know you will Guide me into the right direction to serve you. I'm excited again to love and follow you. In my new adventure, we will have an exciting time, I'm sure. Amen. Mountain, you won't climb up, coming up to me. 